Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Andrew Dalton, and I'm the executive director of the Adams County Historical Society here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. I'm joined by my colleague, Tim Smith, our historian and collections manager. Um, and we are doing the second part of our series called Ask a Historian, uh, where we like to answer as many questions as we possibly can um, in the short period of time we're going to be with you. And last time we, we kind of, well, I think we did answer every question, but it, it took us about an hour and a half. So we will try to do our best to, to get through all of the questions that you might have. We'll talk about everything from the Battle of Gettysburg to uh, early history here in Adams County to research, um, how to research specific uh, topics like genealogy or house, uh, historic house uh, and property research. Um, and uh, whoop, let me make sure my sound is down. <laughs> but if you could, just for a second before we start, if you can hear okay and see us all right, if you could let us know in the comments, I just want to make sure uh, that we're good uh, before we get too far into this. So thanks again for, for joining us. And uh, I do want to make one final plug. If you enjoy our program series and you support the Adams County Historical Society, I really appreciate if this evening you would consider a gift through uh, the Adams County Giving Spree. So if you're not familiar with the Giving Spree, it's a wonderful community event run by our partners, the Adams County Community Foundation. Um, and gifts uh, are, um, it's actually, their gifts are made to over 80 nonprofits locally. And then there's something called a stretch pool. So um, a, a, there's a, a, a fund that is set up that will distribute out to all of the participating nonprofits based on how much is raised at the event. So um, you, we can access matching funds through this wonderful event. I posted the link um, in the top of the description for this video tonight that you can, after this is over, if you um, are willing to do so, we'd appreciate you uh, chipping in to help us. Um, and uh, there's more information as well on that link about this event. But instead of having the regular donate button tonight, we'd really appreciate if you'd consider a gift through the giving spree to help us uh, stretch those dollars even more. And I'll also be posting that link in the comments throughout the, the video tonight. So um, we, again, uh, are, are happy to be with you tonight. Uh, the Adams County Historical Society, as you may know, is a repository with over a million historic items located right here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Um, we do all kinds of, uh, of things for the community, including uh, helping people do research. Uh, we're also, um, you know, the steward of this incredible collection in the future. Uh, actually, on December 16th, we'll be making an announcement about a big project we're just starting um, to actually build a new facility for the Historical Society. We'll have much more uh, on that on December 16th when we're going to make a very big announcement um, and show you exactly what, what, what that project consists of. Um, until then, I hope you'll continue to tune in for these Thursday night programs. So um, we have um, quite a few questions already, but if you have additional questions throughout the program, please don't hesitate to leave them in the comments and I will do my best to get through them all. Um, so I think we'll start with some more research oriented questions. Um, many of you have come into the Historical Society before, I, I, I imagine, uh, and done research. And we have some questions about some of the resources that you can find at the Historical Society for various types of research. Um, so one question uh, is about uh, an element of our collection that we actually are just starting to kind of make more available. Uh, Chuck is asking if we collect oral histories um, and how we collect them, how they're stored, and uh, what we hope to do with them. You want to talk a bit about oral histories? Sure. Well, um, there are a few different types of oral histories that we have in our uh, collections. And um, some of them were uh, collected over the years uh, specifically to talk, to interview people who are older and get their reminiscence about certain events. Um, one of the topics I remember is that um, uh, Gettysburg College professors actually had started a project where they uh, had their students research uh, people who were alive during World War II, or I shouldn't say alive, but people who served in World War II, and they interviewed uh, veterans, and they also interviewed um, uh, uh, civilians and, um, you know, people in the community and what it was like in our community during the war and, you know, uh, what the community was like and how the community was affected by the war effort. And uh, we have a large collection of those things. I, I'd imagine, um, you know, when I say large, maybe a, a, a dozen or two dozen interviews uh, that we have from that. And there on cassette tape, we actually did uh, about, I guess he worked for about a year, year and a half before COVID, and we had a volunteer actually uh, digitizing our cassette tape collection. Now, besides, besides those interviews, we also have cassette tapes, and before that, reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tapes of our monthly meeting. 
And it is amazing that in the 60s and in the 70s and the 80s, we have almost every monthly meeting topic um, on audio. So occasionally people have come in and asked about that collection and we've actually um, got the cassette tapes out and let people listen to them. And these cassette tapes are um, in the process of being digitized and, uh, in, on our um, computer and our uh, hard drive. We also have collections of cassette tapes that are from the outside that have been donated to us. There was a uh, licensed Battlefield guy named George Sheeler, who many of us knew really well. And whenever you saw G George at a, uh, a walking tour uh, by a Battlefield guide or at the historical society, or even at um, uh, the parks meetings that they you know, ha would have on the boundary study, for instance, or on a manage deer management, he would be there and he would be there with his tape recorder. And after he passed away, we came into possession of about 800 of his cassette, cassette tapes of all the things that uh, he taped around the town. We also have a couple outside collections of cassette tapes from uh, Civil War historians that we've managed to acquire over the year. So we have quite a collection of these um, oral histories of subjects or interviews with people. And it's still, um, as Chuck mentioned in, one, uh, in detail in one of his questions, he was asking about if there's an effort to continue to do this. And um, in recent years, there had, there had been such an effort. So we hope to keep up on it and um, keep interviewing people. That's great. One follow-up question to that. Um, are there any civilian, uh, I'm sorry, are there any uh, oral histories that uh, were done with actual eyewitnesses to the Battle of Gettysburg? That would ha obviously would have had to have been in the 30s or 40s. So, um, there, uh, to the best of my knowledge, there is only one, and that is a, um, a record, a recording was done with a man who claims to have been at Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. And uh, last time I looked, it was available on, um, I forget if it's the Library of Congress website or the National Archives website, but you can find it and you can download it and listen to it. And I have listened to it. Right. Uh, <laughs> I personally, um, I don't know. He doesn't say anything in an interview that you couldn't have read <laughs> in a book somewhere else. So I, I don't know how I feel about it. But um, there is such there is such an interview. Right, and I believe we have a copy of the actual, it's like a Victrola oh. record here. Um, yeah, uh, a couple other questions. So uh, I see a lot of you are asking questions, which is wonderful. Um, actually, another kind of follow-up that we didn't get to, does anyone continue to do oral history projects in the classroom here? And uh, Michael Berkner at Gettysburg College I, still does do oral histories uh, with his students, and a lot of those are given to us and are kept here in our collection. Oral history is something we'd love to really branch out and do more of in the future. I think uh, interviewing um, older folks in the community and making sure that their memories are kept safe uh, is something that we're, we're very interested in continuing. Um, so that's a great question from Chuck. Um, so a, a couple other things related to the collection. Uh, do we have any old collections you know, that, uh, of diaries or letters or um, other, other things that are of particular interest that we might you know, digitize or that we've already digitized? That's a pretty good question. Well, I think you know, we're str we strive to keep including things on our website that uh, will help people from the outside to get onto the website and learn more about local history or we try to put something up there that provides a valuable research as a research tool on uh, the website, and we're always doing that. I, I am unaware at the moment if we have um, any diaries, day-to-day -day diaries, but we do have a number of very good ones in our collection. Um, the person asked this question specifically asked about William Wilson's uh, diary from Bendersville. We do not own that original diary. That specific diary is in a private collection somewhere else, and we have a copy of it, and we wouldn't have the rights to put that, make that available on our website. But there's other ones that we do own, and it probably would be valuable to put uh, uh, rare uh, diaries on our, our website. That's something we've been talking about. Um, also, you know, uh, we have volunteers during uh, COVID here working at home to transcribe things from our collection that then we can download into a file and put on our website. And we've talked about it for years, but we're getting close to um, 
compilating a lot of our civilian accounts and transcribing them and maybe annotating some of them and making them more available to the general public so that someone from, let's say, if you live in California and are doing a, a civilians during the Battle of Gettysburg research paper, you can have access to some of our primary documents instead of having to come all the way here and use the documents. Right, that's great. Yeah, um, another really great question, um, uh, actually kind of more about our process here. What are the steps that go into accepting an item into our collection? Really? Um, yeah, I thought that that's was a, good a really question. good That was a real question, not a, so, not um, a plant. <laughs> so, uh, and, and we, um, uh, I think at the moment we um, uh, get a, a hundred or more donations to our uh, archives a year. So basically what happens is people will call us or people will bring us stuff or we'll run into people and they'll ask us if we're interested in things dealing with their local family history or something to deal with a historical topic in Adams County. And the donations that we get, you know, run the gamut. Like we got a huge collection of stuff from uh, the Gettysburg uh, radio station after the radio station went out of business or um, from uh, a local chapter of a non-profit organization or we got a collection of the Carroll Valley Garden Club's <laughs> minutes. Um, but, you know, these things in the future are, are things that, you know, people will be interested in and people will... Uh, you know, we'll read. So what happens is people ask us or bring us things and then um, we decide whether it's a value to Adams County. Like, for instance, we are not interested in collecting uh, antiques. We don't really need a Singer sewing machine. But if it's something that is made or manufactured in Adams County, then we're interested in it. You know, um, so um, uh, but people bring us stuff and then we accept the stuff, we give them a temporary custody form, we go through the stuff, and we accession it, meaning um, we uh, catalog, uh, we make an inventory of what they have given us, and then we send them out a deed of gift, uh, stating what we've given them, and then they, you know, they sign the deed of gift and send it back, and that way they can retain a copy for their, uh, you know, um, personal use of the things that have donated to it. We assign an accession number to it, and then after it, you know, we put it in archival boxes. Uh, uh, we um, then catalog the items into our computer system, and then, you know, theoretically, future generations of visitors to the society can either see those items or use those items in our collection. Right. And I, I would add to that, too. I mean, when we used to accept materials, the, the today's thought, at least, is when you accept a group of materials, you keep them together because they have context. They might be, you know, uh, one person's family notebooks and photographs and uh, letters. Um, back in, I don't know, 19, when we started taking artifacts and, and, and items in the 1950s, <laughs> 60s, 70s, even 80s and 90s, um, that wasn't kind of the prevailing thought, and so things were broken up by subject. So if somebody donated a photograph of Devil's Den, along with all kinds of other family materials, that we would put it in a file called Devil's Den, or we'd put it in a file called Photographs. And luckily, these early donations, though, were, were typically marked or stamped um, with the accession number. So one of the big projects that we've done over the past uh, you know, four or five years is actually kind of rip apart the building um, and our collections and put them back together by uh, the actual original number that they came with. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we find incredible things about context, like a photo had been separated from a letter that explained the photograph and who yeah. was in it, um, or there's even a caption or something that had been taken apart and, and, and was separated. So bringing it yeah. all back together, we've kind of discovered a lot of things and found some really amazing items. In a few weeks, we're going to do a program about you know treasures of the collection, and we'll show you actually some of these really rare artifacts. And that'll be done, I think, the week before we, we make our big announcement. Um, and then after that point, we'll be talking a lot more about the collection and the future of uh, how things are going to be preserved and, and displayed. So, and, and, good and question. Yeah, that primarily, that was done because... Um, uh, we didn't have a computer with an index on it that you could just punch in and search for something that would tell you where it is. So that if uh, you wanted to look at photographs of Devil's Den, you know, today on our computer, you just put in the keywords Devil's Den and all the photographs in the various collections of families standing in front of Devil's Den come up on the computer, even though there are different places in the building. But at that point, 
you, you didn't have something like that. So if you want to look at photographs of Devil's Den, you just go to the Devil's Den file and look at the photographs of the families in front of the rocks. Right, and we have a lot of photos of families in front of Devil's Den. Yeah. <laughs> good example. <laughs> yeah, good. So a couple other questions. Just a couple, I'll, I'll hit, we'll hit these quick, very specific. Um, someone's asking about a, tr a piece of land called the Scott Cedar Tract. And I, I am sure neither of us have probably heard of it. No. But they said it's uh, near Ridge Road and U.S. Avenue, southwest of Gettysburg. Do you kind of know where that is? Could you give that person a description? Ridge Road. Ridge Road and U.S. Avenue is what they're they're giving us. US I don't know. If, off the top of my head, I can't think of where exactly I can't, that I is. Can't, I, yeah. We'll get back to you on that one. <laughs> and then someone asking about the Adams family, not the, the TV show. Thomas and Magdalena Adams. I think that's probably a very specific question. I don't, do we know, we probably don't know They're anything. probably talking about the people who live near uh, Brushtown. Okay. Yeah, do you have more on that? Feel free um, to, well, to talk about Well, you know, about um, I think they're talking about the Revolutionary War veteran and his family that are early settlers of the uh, um, Conawaga Chapel area, early Catholics in the area, and they, had, they were large land owners. Um, uh, kind of near the edge of McSherry's town along uh, around Centennial Road area. Um, but each of these and even the other tract we're talking about, these names of these tracts of land, when you applied for a warrant in Pennsylvania as an early settler, uh, there was a place where you could fill in like a name for a tract of land. And a lot of people did that. Right. And so in these early land warrants, you find these names. But these names aren't like used right. in any context. Carol's Delight. And I don't yeah. think they put much time or effort into thinking of the name right. of the piece of land they wrote on the warrant because, right. you know, they're, they have varying. Um, a good example is if you ride up uh, the Harrisburg Road um, uh, towards, uh, um, you know, where Distal Finks was. I think on the right, it's, I think it's uh, Castle Hill um, uh, Mobile Home Park. And they got that name. Um, from the name off the original gr land grant. And I, I get the feeling that sometimes um, people think that maybe these names were like the name of a community or the name has been used over time. But uh, most of the time I find the name appears one time and is never used again and it's on that early warrant. Someone's asking about the town of Pinchtown. Pinchtown. Yeah, I, I'm sure I've you're heard, the only person in the world well, who knows the answer no, to this question. No, I do not know where Pinchtown is, but there's lots of places in the area that are called Pinch Gut. Oh, okay, and that might be it. usually yeah. it's a village right. that is in an intersection that is oddly shaped, so that instead of a, a 90 degree uh, crossroads, um, you know, one corner of the road uh, pinches off a piece of land and they build in that piece of land. And so we have several, several right. places around the county <laughs> that were known as Pinch Gut. And I'd imagine Pinch Town is probably one of those places right. also. And we do have a map. We did created a map that you can access on Google Maps. We, I'm not sure if we have the link on our website yet, but that uh, labels all of the place names that um, oh. some are still around, some not so much. Yeah, and we do have a, um, a book that uh, uh, was put together many years ago by our volunteers, and it has a, uh, a listing for every place name in the county, every village or town, it's really towns or villages, excuse me. And in the book, it, you, it gives a name and it'll tell you the various maps that name appears on. And when, it first when we were able to first locate it as the name of a, a place. Right, right. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we'll get through some more of these questions. Um, good question. Uh, there's another really good question. Do we have any artifacts from the 1938 reunion of the battle? Oh, we have lots of yeah, them. Yeah, that's a, a great um, and, one. And of course, I'm sure some of you out there probably already know this, but um, uh, a local Adams County resident who was a very prominent political figure in Pennsylvania, John Rice, was sort of the chairman of the 75th anniversary committee. And of course, his family were part of the Apple uh, producers in Northern Adams County. And uh, John Rice, uh, his um, relatives gave us his collection of artifacts, and it contains a huge amount of photographs from the 1913, or I'm sorry, 1938 reunion, including um, uh, all the different preparations that took place around the area for that reunion. We have several also, besides that, we have several scrapbooks that were kept by uh, Adams County residents at the time. Um, one of my favorites is, of course, uh, Sarah Black, who lived at the Sweeney House or the 
Farnsworth house in the town of Gettysburg. She kept a scrapbook where she went around, took her, took photographs of veterans, had them sign her book. And I think we might have um, five scrapbooks such as that from the 1938 reunion. And of course, you know, we have um, um, on our wall, I guess, in the research, um, in the Civil War room, we have uh, one of the large 75th anniversary signs that was hung around town at that time. I'd imagine we had some other stuff I can't think of at the moment, but there's a lot of stuff. Right, right. I think we have a tent. Um, a tent peg. Tent peg. Yeah. A couple other great questions. Uh, so I think now uh, there's some questions that we have. I will shift a little bit toward um, 1863 and the civilian experience and the civilians and the farms of the battlefield. Um, so a couple questions. Um, one kind of just more general. What was the level of departure after the battle? You know, how many families left and actually left for good? I mean, we know of some a couple famous ones like the Slider family, for instance. Um, there were, we believe, in the African-American community that we know of the fact that there are some families that kind of never... Uh, end up coming back, move through here very quickly, um, and and, and uh, do not return. But do we know of? I, I don't know if we know that? of a lot of families that completely left because of the battle. I mean, you know, um, the Slider family. It, they don't say in their account that they leaving because of the battle. They did just happen to move right. west. A lot of families will move west during that period, right. prior to and after uh, the battle. And I don't know if they feel like they're moving to a place that's out of the danger. The one example that strikes me, of course, would be uh, William Bliss, a guy from New York State that had moved here and just before the Civil War bought land, and then his house and his barn were burned to the ground during the battle, and then he moved back to New York. Uh, where uh, he remained for the rest of his life. And he specifically left because of the battle and, you know, and was right, forced to right. not to... But very few, you'd, I, and I think we'd say yeah. very, very few. I think uh, most of the families that were here prior to the battle probably returned after the battle. Now, of course, you got to consider the fact that we have lots and lots and lots of renters. So if you bought property, you own property, you're more likely to stay. And if you're a renter, you might just happen to live in this area at the time of the Civil War and then move away. Sarah Broadhead, for instance, who's a very famous civilian, her and her husband uh, moved into this area. They lived here for six years during their life. But of course, four of those years were amongst the mo most tumultuous years in our nation's history. Right, right. Yeah, so another question, um, I think we'll go into some specific questions about farms. We had one question about the Rose Farm. Um, someone asking if, uh, and it's a very specific question, but obviously, you know, the Rose Farm was the scene of some of the heaviest and most, you know, violent action during the yeah. battle. Um, I think you're smiling. Did perhaps no, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know what the question is? I don't know what the question is. <laughs> um, that this person suggesting that um, that they had read somewhere that bodies or perhaps limbs were dumped in the well, um, or somehow contaminated the well, which I think is is certainly yeah. reasonable. And the question is, you know, where I guess more broadly, when these wells uh, on the battlefield were contaminated, where did the the citizens go to get their water? Um, I don't know if we have a good answer to that. But no, any, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, you you would try to find get one that, water yeah. out of your neighbor's well. The right. problem with it was that uh, water contamination can be everywhere, and you know you have an issue with that. And a lot, um, I would say this. I, I personally hadn't looked into it, but um, one of our good friends and a guy who volunteers here uh, a lot is a guy named Bobby Hoosh. And he did a presentation for the historical society on this very subject. And he just took the amount of people that died prior to the Battle of Gettysburg that were reported in the newspaper in Evergreen Cemetery burial permits, and then took the amount of people that died after the battle in Evergreen Cemetery burial permits and mentioned in the newspaper, examined the numbers, looked at um, the diseases they were dying from, and just, you know, came up with startling evidence that yes the water was bad after the battle and a lot of young people and a lot of older people were affected by it and uh, the mortality rate of the, those two groups of people was much greater immediately after the battle than it was before the battle right but beyond doing that it was an amazing piece of work he did um, you know i don't think there's any other way to tell now many farms on the battlefield um, their well was contaminated they dug a new well um, we know that uh, um, 
Lydia Leister specifically mentions that in an interview that she had after the battle that her well went bad. Um, uh, also, uh, the Rose Farm, the reason we know that they used a new well was it is mentioned in an account that their well had bodies in it and they had to um, uh, dig a new well. But on the Warren map of the battlefield, their, um, the well where they get their water from, their spring, you, you can see it on there and then you can see a spring house in photographs that they build after the Civil War at a different location. So you can actually see that they had a water source before the battle and then after the battle in a different location. Of course, um, uh, you know, this uh, all gets back to the famous story at South Mountain, you know, where bodies are dumped in a well and, you know, the farmer uh, has to dig a new well. But uh, uh, do you want to mention the one at Her Tavern that is yeah, an interesting right. story? Yeah, we do have a, a, an account from uh, an unidentified African-American woman um, who was a servant of a family that was living near the Her Tavern. After the battle, she discussed in the account that um, the well had been contaminated by amputated you know, limbs that had been thrown down into it. And you know, it was making the soldiers who were at Her Tavern very sick. Uh, and uh, they pumped the well out and found that there was, you know, there was a piece of a hand, evidently, that they uh, they pulled out of the well. So, yeah, this is a horrendous, you know, situation. I, I was reading, so I don't. I apologize if you already mentioned it, but the the Herbst Farm on the Gettysburg I Battlefield, um, near the Her Tavern, near Willoughby's Run, uh, Mrs. Herbst, I think Louisa yeah. Herbst, uh, was um, yeah. died of dysentery following the battle. And we actually have an account of the property of the Herbst Farm that talks about how you know it was a massive hospital. There were you know, there was tons of contamination of the water supplies. Um, so it is, like, like Tim said, I mean, we don't know the exact number, but we know that there was a dramatic rise um, yeah. in, in deaths due to disease following the battle. And that's something, we're, you know, we, we don't, I don't think there's been a lot of attention paid to mm -hmm. that. And we talk about people, Jenny Wade's obviously famous as the only, uh, supposed only civilian casualty, but Killed have, during the battle. Right, but we have yeah. other civilians who were killed after the battle, picking up artillery shells. We have people shot in the town who were wounded. Uh, and we have people who died of disease following the battle in the weeks and months later. So, I mean, I think, you know, what, what's the number you use? 30? Is it, we, we said? Yeah, I say you know, 30. There's not probably, counting the people who die of disease. Right. So not counting disease. We have 30 casualties plus disease. I mean, maybe we're talking, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, 60 or 70 people um, who, who are, are, you know, wounded or, or die as a direct result of the battle. So um, great question. So a couple others. We've got one uh, specific question about another farm. Um, about the Jacob Weikert, uh, Jacob Henry Weikert farm and his wife Matilda. Is there any, anything you can, you can it's tell funny, us about I, I that? I think I, uh, I answered an email uh, for the same guy um, mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. But uh, basically, I guess he's related to uh, the Jacob Henry Weikert, not the famous Jacob Weikert family that lived at, um, you know, down uh, at Little Round Top, but they lived a little north of Round Top. And this Jacob Weikert is not the son of Jacob Weikert, although Jacob Weikert has a son named Jacob Weikert. Am I confusing you? Yeah. This is a guy <laughs> named Jacob Weikert, who's the son of George Weikert, <laughs> who ends up living on the Tony Town Road near the other Jacob Weikert because he married Matilda Slider, the uh, daughter of uh, John Slider. And they lived in a little white house that still stands. It was probably built in 1862. Um, and today it's called the Round Top Farm. And um, it's uh, part of a, a, a rental unit that is associated with the Dobbin house. So you could, your family could come to Gettysburg, you could rent the house for a week and live on the Tony Town Road, not far uh, from Little Round Top. And the back of the property, there's actually a, a lumber road that leads up onto the back side of the hill. It's very interesting. And um, I did find, uh, I didn't uh, tell this person in the email when they were asking about this family, I did find a civilian account uh, from one of the daughters at that house saying it was used as a hospital afterwards and um, uh, her memory of the battle, I think she's like five, remember was riding in a wagon down the road away from the battle and watching leaves fall out of the tree into the wagon that had been shot out of the trees by bullets that were passing over her head. Wow. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> but um, um, that family, the Wakert family, the daughter of Matilda Slider, you know, being, a, being his wife being a slider, they actually moved with the sliders. And of course, with Josephine Miller, who had married one of the sliders to Ohio. And off the top of my head, I don't remember why I know this, maybe Mansfield, Ohio, they moved to. 
Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, a couple other civilian-related questions. Um, actually, first, I just two comments about the well uh, that we a, oh. a lot of people really enjoyed the stories <laughs> that we were telling about wells and yeah. and the contamination of the the battlefield. Um, would they have used lime in the contaminated wells? Yeah, you, you read yeah. that a lot. Yeah, yes. we have seen that in quite a few. Yes. Uh, yeah, they're accounts. spreading lime everywhere. Yep. Um, does it do any good to dig a new well? Um, I think. <laughs> yeah. Probably. I think that's probably what we would have done. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, but we don't know. I don't think we have an account of, of somebody like having to dig a new well. I don't. Uh, well, I mean, that would have taken quite a long time. Do we know about... Lydia Leister says okay, specifically. That they had to dig yeah. a new well. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's great. Good question. Um, and did the Confederates deliberately poison the wells when they left the field with corpses? I like that. Probably, um, probably not. I, but I don't know if we know of anything, but there were a lot of rumors about contaminated water sources like yeah. the, the spring. Um, on yeah. the, the Harmon farm on Willoughby's run um, was supposedly so laxative that it caused the soldiers to have a lot of stomach problems. And uh, uh, they, they thought at the time, they didn't know about the mineral qualities, they thought it was the Confederates who had poisoned it. Um, or, yeah, I don't think you know. the Southerners are poisoning the wells. But, <laughs> right. you know, one interesting, there is an interesting story of a, uh, of a lady um, on one of the farms uh, a little southwest of town and she's handing water out to Confederate soldiers and none of the soldiers will take the water from her because they think that she's poisoning Confederate wounded soldiers. Right. And she's really upset by that when, they, <laughs> when she figures out that's why they won't take the water. But uh, I, no, I don't think there's any evidence of anybody poisoning anybody. Right, right. Another good question. So this is someone who, who reads a lot about Gettysburg and, and the, the terrain features on the battlefield. Cool. And he's asking if there's any map that shows kind of all of the... the, the the locales on the battlefield, like Stony Hill, the Slaughter Pen, uh, some sort of map no. that actually labels all of the, the terms that we hear when we read about. No, and, uh, and I, I think accounts. there's a conflict sometimes with this. You know, this is something that's very near and dear to my heart, naming areas of the battlefield. Uh, so I'm very interested in that too. But uh, there's two inherent problems with it. One of them is uh, there is a great desire after the battle by the participants mostly to name the places where they fought so that they can discuss the places in their accounts of the battle. Um, uh, so, you know, they're the ones who come up with the names of places that we know of today. Like, I maintain, um, I don't know if all my colleagues agree with me, but I maintain there's no such thing as a little round top prior to the battle. Um, you know, and uh, Cemetery Ridge, you're not calling, the locals aren't calling it Cemetery Ridge. You know, these, a lot of these names are, uh, invented uh, for these places to so that the right. soldiers who fought in the battle can discuss the area where they fought. So there's a uh, you know more propensity to come up with names. Any exception to that? Well, there are exceptions right. now, but again, sometimes I don't know if there's exceptions, but sometimes places are named by the locals right. before the battle, and sometimes those local names have carried over. Like for instance. Culp's Hill, right. you know, or uh, Cemetery Hill, or Seminary Hill becomes, you know, Seminary Ridge, right. or Oak Ridge. What about Devil's Den? What's the first known reference yeah, the, we well, have to the, Devil's Den? At the Den? moment, the first known reference to Devil's Den comes after the battle. And a lot of references suggest it was called that before the battle, but I can't remember, I wrote a book about Devil's Den. I was not able to find a single reference to Devil's Den that predated the battle. Now, there are accounts where people are calling Little Round Top Devil's Den. Uh, and it's very popular, the Devil's a very popular name for a place where there's lots of rocks. Like, uh, you know, on the Adams-Franklin County line over there uh, near um, Monterey, there's a place called the Devil's Race Course. And it's a uh, a place with a lot of rocks, or down just in Frederick, Maryland, there's a place called the Devil's Backbone. And all these places have a lot of rocks. So the, the term devil is used by people, Pennsylvania German farmers, to describe a place where there's ro lots of rocks. And so um, Devil's Den's a natural name for that area, but, um, and it, maybe it was called that before the battle by someone, but it wasn't a generally known term. Now he mentioned Stony Hill. It's called Stony Hill, for instance, uh, at the uh, western edge of the wheat field, uh, because that's what um, Kershaw referred to that area in his official report of the battle that was written later. But that term, 
uh, would not even been seen by local people until the official reports were published. And, you know, that was made, made known when people read the printed version of the official reports uh, in, after 1880. And that term, Stony Hill, was never used by anybody. It was a, it's a, I couldn't tell you who the first person to coin the term was in an article, but that's probably like a 1980s term. That's something that we use, you know, more, the triangular, triangular field is a term that no one used until I think maybe the 1980s. Wow. So, so um, you know, we're constantly, and hopefully, you know, I'm, I come up with terms all the time that I try to push onto people <laughs> to use in the future. So the problem with such a map is, he, is to answer his direct question, when we put right. a map and we put all the place names on the map that we use right. on our tours or we use on a daily basis, right. that we put beside them, this term was coined the by, year that it was coined. you know. And here's so, a question. This is not a question from here, but my question <laughs> to you is, is there any term you've coined oh, yes. for something that has been picked up and is used, you know, maybe I wouldn't say widely, but at least is used in, yeah, I think, among I other think, guides. Uh, you, you'd have to ask other, um, <laughs> other guys, but it is funny when I hear somebody out there use a term that I know I coined, like maybe Benning's Knoll. Okay, the rise of ground just yeah. south of Devil's Den. Or the run up and of course, rock. The Gary, rock names, yeah, right? Rock <laughs> names. You know, I'm all about rock names. So I, I might be more responsible for rock names. But I can tell you this. I'll tell you about two failures. John Batchelder, the government historian, realized when he was writing about the battle that people call the area where the McPherson's farm is McPherson's Ridge, where the barn sits. But where the monuments sit a few, a couple hundred yards farther back, people refer to that also as McPherson's Ridge. And these are two distinct separate ridges with a swale in them. And early on in the 1880s, he decided, well, actually, I think it was in 1870 in his book, Gettysburg, What to See, How to See It. He decided that we'd call the westernmost ridge with the barn on it, McPherson's Ridge, and the eastern ridge, Buford's Ridge because that's where the monuments of General John Buford's Cavalry Division are located. And he promoted this, and no one uses that term today. He wanted to name Little Round Top Weed's Hill in honor huh. of the death of Stephen Weed. And even on the Batchelder isometric map, it's called Weed's Hill. Wow. No one accepted that. It didn't, ca it didn't carry. Wow. And me, a failure of mine. <laughs> I realized early on that Culp's Hill is a series of hills, and the larger hill is Culp's Hill. They're owned by the Culp family. But there's another hill that's closer to Spangler Spring, right. and there's a gully between the two. And for some reason, people keep calling it Lower Culp's Hill. But it's not owned by the Culp family. It's owned by the Spangler family. So I've tried desperately <laughs> to get people to call that Spangler's Hill to differentiate that from Culp Hill, and no one is helping me with this at all. <laughs> so good question. That's great. Wonderful question. Somebody just said they have some uh, very old stenciled uh, chairs that say from Gettysburg. Uh, very oh. interesting. We'd love to see photos of that if you, you'd like to send them well, to us. Well, you can always email our photos. And, yeah. You know, yeah. Well. A couple other questions. So, uh, there was a Reverend Schaefer who lived on Chambersburg Street during the battle across from yep. the Gary Owen restaurant. Charles Schaefer. Yep. And this person's asking who the Reverend Schaefer was, anything you know about his background. Wow. It's tough off the top of yeah, your head. Yeah, tough off the top of my head, <laughs> but um, he is uh, one of the professors that uh, is associated with uh, Lutheran Theological Seminary. Um, I don't remember. Some of them, I think he also might teach classes at Gettysburg College. You know, prior to the Civil War, the Lutheran Seminary and Gettysburg College are associated together. But I do know that um, Schaefer lived on Chambersburg Street, on the north side of Chambersburg Street, in uh, the second block. I'm going to guess uh, 130 Chambersburg Street. I think, if I'm not mistaken, that Lucius Fairchild, the colonel of the 2nd Wisconsin, ends up in Schaefer's house. You can check all this because I'm just you to say this off the top of my head. I think you're right, because the person said that one of their favorite Gettysburg heroes was treated there. That Lucius probably, Fairchild. Yep. Oh, yep. one of my favorite Gettysburg heroes also. <clears throat> Mike, the greatest story about him is that he's wounded in the first day's fighting, leading the Iron Brigade into charge early in the morning. And he's taken to that house, and his arm is amputated. 
And by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, as the northern army is retreating through the town, they bring him out onto the front porch of the house, and they say he, you know, with his good arm, I don't know which arm he lost, he's, <laughs> uh, you know, encouraging the boys as they're retreating through the town a few hours later. And um, uh, we do have a uh, letter uh, from the brother of Schaefer, I believe, about his time in, in the Schaefer house. Uh, from, I'm sorry, from um, um, a Fairchild's brother. And then we have, I think we have a, a letter by a soldier that is in the next door house that also talks Isn't about there a photograph as uh, well the of daughter. him returning to, to the place. Yeah, um, yeah. in uh, the state of Wisconsin, they have a history of the. Um, of Lucius Fairchild. Of course, he became the governor of uh, Wisconsin. And in the book, and I had never seen it before until someone came to Historical Society one day with the book and said, hey, have you ever seen this? And there's a photograph taken much later, like 1890, where Fairchild is standing on the side porch of the house, uh, Schaefer's house, where he was uh, taken to. Yeah, um, that's great. Um, so a couple other questions. So, someone's asking about Senator William Martin, who had a sawmill on the Shippensburg Road. Is that anything you're familiar with? Well, I'm, I'm not, That's but um, um, probably state senator. Yes, I would and, imagine. And um, it does sound very familiar. And I think we're talking about um, uh, on the Shippensburg Road. Right. I thought we were talking about, the, uh, I thought it was before you get, you know, uh, through the narrows. Right. This is someone involved with uh, helping to establish the railroad in Adams County is oh. what the person's saying. He's so, probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we'd have to, I'm sure we have something in our collection on that. Um, we'd have to look into it a little bit more. Wonderful questions. Um, so another question, uh, kind of along the same lines of, of the uh, the names of places in the battlefield. Someone's asking about the streets of Gettysburg and how they got their names. Cool. Um, of course, some of them you probably, you know, Middle Street is because it's the middle of town. Yeah. Uh, Baltimore Street, because because it leads to Baltimore. Many of the roads are named because yeah. it's the place that the road would take you to. High Street. Right. And high the street. highest street in town. <laughs> but are there any, I think um, it would be good, maybe we could talk about a couple that are, um, that, that are, you know, might be named after people or other things that people wouldn't think of. Do we know? I know we get asked this a lot, but Stratton Street is very yeah. interesting. What, we what do not know. Uh, Stratton Street uh, gets its name. And here's what I do. You know, um, there are two ways to figure out when a street is named. First of all, you could actually go through the borough minutes and read the, the minutes of, um, uh, you know, when the borough council meets. And we have the minutes either on microfilm or, uh, you know, copies of the minutes. And you could try to look through the minutes and see when they say, when they usually open up a road, they usually give it a name. Or you could simply get on like newspapers.com. <laughs> uh, bring up Gettysburg newspapers and put type in Stratton Street and see when the first time the street name appears, Liberty Street. Um, Stratton Street st appears in the 1840s, and uh, there's no one in the town of Gettysburg named Stratton at that time. Um, we uh, don't know why they chose Stratton Street. There's no mention of why that uh, street was given that name. Uh, Elwood Christ, who was a former uh, assistant director of the Adams County Historical Society and historian. It was always his pet theory, and you know, I, I guess I go along with it, that it's named after Tom Thumb. Uh, Tom Thumb, whose actual name was uh, Charles Stratton, I believe, uh, toured the country during that period. And, some, and I think there is evidence that at some point he did visit Gettysburg or pass through Gettysburg. You know, um, uh, we're talking about, um, you know, in case you don't know who Tom Thumb is, um, the famous um, uh, uh, man, uh, I guess he, I don't know, uh, um, I guess a midget, we call him. Yeah. Oh, and then oh, sorry, yeah. he and his wife <laughs> uh, toured a with uh, person. Yes. Barnum. Um, oh, P.T. Barnum. P.T. Yes. Barnum. Yep. And it was very famous. You can go <laughs> on my line. But, uh, you know, we... It, our best guess is it's named because someone uh, wanted to honor him, but there's nothing in the paper that says right, this. Right, right. Yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, but, uh, comment. <laughs> other, other, you know, one thing I like to point out is it's very difficult for people researching do, deeds because, you know, road street names change. Like, for instance, when originally laid out, the town, 
uh, Carlisle Street did not lead to Carlisle. Right. So it wasn't called Carlisle Street until right. they built the connector road in 1829. Right. It was called North Baltimore Street. Yep. And Chambersburg Street did not lead to Chambersburg. It was called West York Street. And Washington Street or um, uh, was originally called West Street in the early deeds. And then they named it Washington Street, right. and then they put another street, and they named that West Street. And then that street <laughs> was renamed Franklin Street, and then, the and then street West, street West Street moved to the next area where today it's West right. Street. And then I think Liberty Street at one point was on this side of the borough, uh, on the western side, and then, and then got moved to the eastern side. Right. So the names, and then the, the new thing is Mayor Alley, um, Alley's. All the alleys yeah. have to have names. Right. And so you see things like Mayor Alley or you see Legion Alley. Right. Or, and you're wondering, wow, what's that alley named after? My favorite is Wall Alley oh. that goes <laughs> um, along the backside of the old jail property where they had the wall of the jail. So it's named Wall Alley. I have a really, I have a question that I really love because it's from another, I went to Gettysburg College, some of you may know. Um, we have an alum asking this question. I, I've never heard this story been told before, but I love it. Uh, she writes, when I was a student at Gettysburg College, there was an area called Stein Lake, which was, you know, are you familiar with that? It's the strip of land by the li outside the library. Um, no, right in the ahead. center. It's called Stein Lake. The students still call it Stein Lake. Um, it's a, kind of a joke because it's a big open grassy area and they call okay. it a lake. Um, uh, that would always flood. It, it, it does still flood from time to time. The story they told the first year students was that there were arms and legs buried there after the battle and they kept washing up. So eventually they cemented them so that they wouldn't wash up and that explained the flooding. Isn't that great? <laughs> that is. <basically. laughs> no, there is, there's no truth to that, but I think there is a, a sliver of, of accuracy because we do know that there were, uh, there's at least a significant amount of Confederate bodies buried uh, behind or north of Pennsylvania Hall on the Gettysburg College campus. We don't know exactly where. Um, we don't know if they were all removed or some may remain there. I would doubt that there would be any left just given all the disruption to the, the land. But I, th I love stories like that. That uh, I think so. The question is, was it true or just told to gullible first year students? So. <laughs> that's always the issue, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. There is some truth to it, though. Um, that's a great question. Uh, another qu So a couple other things about our records. Someone's asking, do we have records of family cemeteries? Of course, there's church cemeteries, there's public cemeteries, but what about the smaller family um, cemeteries? We do have records of cemeteries, a pretty good uh, record of cemeteries in the area. I, I would say um, uh, on our list, I, I calculated one time on one of our lists, there's mentions of 110 different cemeteries that exist or once existed in Adams County. Now, family burial grounds, there's, you know, that's a serious issue. Um, okay, so early on, Settlers died, and settlers were buried in their backyards. I mean, I think we need to look at that. Uh, we have tombstones from the 1730s and 40s at um, our Kahnawaga, uh, or the, you know, great, um, I guess I'm, um, uh, Kahnawaga Settlement, the, the Reform Church down there. And um, in uh, great Kahnawaga, I was going to say, in Hunterstown up here, we have some um, tombstones from the 1730s and 40s. And, and the case might be for uh, Belmont Road, you know, the Upper Marsh Creek and Lower Marsh Creek cemeteries, I should say. They have 1740s graves in them. But for the most part, up maybe even until the 1820s, when somebody died, they just buried them in their backyard. And I'm sure largely they were just wooden headstones and they've faded or, you know, right. they were destroyed and they weren't replaced. But some of the families maintain small family cemeteries. And, uh, you know, if there's a tombstone in the county in a location, we probably have a record of it here at the society. It's pretty good. Now, there are exceptions. I know of a couple. Like, for instance, on the 1872 map for, um, I think it's a Butler Township, there's a cemetery shown along the Goldenville Road, not far from Table Rock Road, and there's no cemetery there today, but it's shown on this map, so there obviously was a cemetery at that time, and I have no knowledge of that cemetery. I mean, uh, there are places probably that have been lost over the years, but um, if there's stones there that exist there today, we have a record of it. Right. That's great. Um, and the, the same person's asking something. I never really thought about this, but um, do we know when you, you were um, no longer permitted to 
bury uh, people on private land. I think you can still get a permit. I don't know when it happened, but I do remember that there is someone buried uh, down the Tony Town Road on a, in a, on, a, on a farm off of, um, I th uh, maybe I should mention where it is. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> Sorry. But there is a person buried um, recently. Um, I, I'm gonna say recently, it's probably in the 1990s and on their own property. And in a not, and when we say this on their own property, anybody can be cremated and their ashes can be thrown around right. without a permit. Like a uh, we see that at the national park all the time where people <laughs> right. just throw ashes everywhere. But uh, on this farm, uh, not far south of Gettysburg, on the Tony Town Road, there's actually a little mausoleum in yeah. someone's backyard. And you, just, you got to get a permit right. for that. I think you can still do it. That's a good question. But you got to get a permit. And the same person asking if these cemeteries are protected. Um, I think it really depends. I would say no. <laughs> <laughs> I probably, yeah, I think it I would, depends on who owns the yeah, property now yeah. and if they're, you know, yeah. there's... I would there's, say... It's really you know. difficult. That's a really good question. I would right. say even church cemeteries or public cemeteries right. are not protected the way they should be. We have be. several abandoned cemeteries yeah. in the county. Oh, yes. Um, oh, it's yes. definitely a, yes. a, a problem. Yeah. Um, so a great question. Yeah. Uh, someone bringing up along those lines, there used to be a headstone located at the Motel at least headquarters. Um, cool. We do know. I think we even know who the, the I person know a lot buried about there is. That. Beulah Base Horror. Oh, I good. Believe, I was, right? You know what? I was, I was covered yeah. up with it. Beulah. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, we, the headstone, I think the American Battlefield Trust still owns the stone. We don't believe that she, this, this girl was actually buried there. In fact, they did. Mm -hmm. I, I believe they did yeah. ground penetrating so radar. What happened there was, you know, there was a stone behind uh, Larson's Quality Inn. And the stone was behind the hotel. And it was up against the wall of the hotel. And... Um, you know, uh, when the American Battlefield Trust started to renovate or recreate that property to a civil repair, people, you know, said, hey, there's a stone there. Don't you know about that? And, of course, I had already known about that. There actually were two stones on the property. There was another one on the uh, south of the Chambersburg Pike uh, and another location uh, between a fence row. But um, that, that stone was for a girl that died in Littlestown. And I think his name is George Bayshore that owned the property there for a time. And when his daughter died, they lived in Littlestown on the farm. And then later he bought this property up here. And obviously he moved the stone from there to up to that location. And that stone had been probably moved around. I don't know if it was even, you know, recently if it was in the location it was originally put at on that farm. But uh, American Battlefield Trust did ground penetrating radar to see if there was a grave under that stone and there was no grave under that stone. The stone had just been placed there. But then we took the ground penetrating radar equipment and used it for other places on the property and used it across the street to find the foundation of um, the house that we right. did the archaeological dig, the Riggs house. Right. Good. Okay. So I want to get through the last remaining questions here. Um, we got a few minutes left. Um, some of these we can answer quickly. Um, has anyone ever found the 1860 census from Union Township, Adams County? Yeah, no. <laughs> now, um, Larry Bowen, who is a volunteer. Oh, and uh, somebody asked if Larry Bowen is, is still, still a volunteer. volunteer. Yes. And, uh, yeah, uh, uh, you know, he hasn't been in because of COVID, uh, but um, he was coming in. And, uh, yes, I would still count him as a volunteer, and I would welcome him. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he's not uh, watching this, but I would welcome him any day that uh, he would like to start volunteering again here after after the uh, pandemic ends. But um, uh, Larry Bowen did a, a, a sort of a finder's guide for people, who, almost like a replacement for the Conewaga Township, um, uh, you know, census. And so for whatever reason, we don't have that census. I, I have I don't know the details right. of the. Yeah, there's a lot of missing things with censuses. Like I'm sure many of you have done research know that 1890 census was destroyed in a fire. Um, and most of that, if not all of it, is gone. But uh, I think locally, that's a good point. We, we, this is one thing we're just not sure what happened to it. Um, another person asking about old road petitions in Adams County. And we do have a lot of records related yeah. to the early roads. Uh, some of them I think we've gotten from the state. Uh, yeah. Some are from York County because they're, yeah. they're earlier. Uh, but we do have some you know, surveys and, and road dockets where yeah. they actually list yeah. um, all of the properties that a new road would cross. Um, all of the streams, all of the intersecting roads, and it would label houses in some cases yeah. as well. We could probably do a whole program on that. Yeah, early um, roads are Is there any, uh, anything published, or is it just these Well, these Dr. Records? Gladfelter, um, uh, Dr. Charles Gladfelter, the former director, he did compile a book 
um, and it's just his handwritten notes on abstracts of road petitions that he looked at over the years. And we do have it on our research shelf. It's not one of the things we've digitized because it's not, we'd have to make a, a photocopy of each page. Um, it's in, it's in it, and again, it's in handwriting, which of course people can't read today. Right. No, but right. <laughs> uh, uh, he did compile such a work and we use it all the time and it's a valuable resource for us here. But again, it's something that we have in our research room that is only available if you come here. Right. Yeah, and the last question, this is from our, our, our friend, uh, uh, Richard Sell in Arizona. Um, he's asking if there's any comprehensive publication on churches in Adams County before 1800. He notes that Dr. Gladfelter's work um, does uh, some, some things on these, uh, uh, on these churches, but is there anything else other than that? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, you know, that book that he's referring to by Dr. Gladfelter, Pastors and People, that was printed by the Pennsylvania German Society, is a fabulous resource. And if I have a question on a congregation or on a minister or a pastor from that time period, I just go to that book and look. And also he provides footnotes in the book that provides you with other sources like where the church records of that particular congregation may exist or um, things you can go to. Now, of course, that was written a long time ago, and it's possible that, you know, records have surfaced or, you know, um, uh, we try to keep a file, uh, a vertical file on each church or congregation in the county and put information such as that in it. But I think he specifically at the, I saw that question asked about the um, Mennonite congregations. I, I, I'm not familiar with any more information that we have uh, on that subject. Right. But um, uh, that was uh, Richard Sell, right? Right. Yes. Uh, Good. Yeah, I yeah, haven't yeah. seen him in a while. If you're watching, uh, good to hear from you. Yeah. Okay, and then we have a question um, about Native Americans in Adams County I want to make sure we get to. Uh, we have a, just a couple minutes. It is 8 o'clock. We'll, we'll keep going for a few minutes here. Oh, There's just the two more questions. Mm -hmm. um, so this person's asking about Native Americans in Adams County. I found an article that mentions uh, that a local uh, citizen was, was sharpening tools for Native Americans, but this guy wasn't born until the late 1700s. Um, I think that that's probably, I would doubt that there were Native Americans here in the yeah. late 1700s. Mm -hmm. I, the, the, for those of you who aren't familiar, you know, Native Americans were here for many thousands of years uh, prior to the European arrival um, in the 1730s and 40s. Um, at the time the Europeans arrived, there were no Native Americans that we know of actually living in what is now Adams County. Yeah. Uh, so there's very little interaction, um, if, yeah. if any. I think the very, very, very early settlers uh, were involved in the, the trade that was going on through the region, like uh, um, what's the, the guy's name in the the trader? Like Hans uh, Steelman. Steelman. Um, but uh, I would doubt that there was any real interaction. Yeah, yeah, and, and we're probably talking about transient groups that were passing through, and we're not sure. Uh, we debate about this all the time whether uh, you know when the last settlements of Native Americans in this area uh, left, and was it you know pri how how long was it between? They're leaving, and uh, the first uh, American, uh, Native, I should say, European settlers in the same area. So they, they don't seem to overlap. But um, you can just look at the enormous amount of artifacts that have been found in our county in fields and long creeks uh, that at one time uh, there were people inhabiting this area. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, that's a that's great. Um, and then, okay, so that uh, the very last question, I wanted to save this one for last. Uh, it's from our good friend Mike Shen. And I wanted to maybe cut it down to a, you know one question for each of us. What is your what do you think is the rarest artifact in the historical society collection, wow. and what do you think mm -hmm. makes it so special or important? I think that's um, that's a really good question. Wow. Um, I didn't actually have time to think about. The I didn't think about it artifact at all. in our collection. Um, I think I have to say, though, we have a, and, and we'll we'll talk about this more in a couple of weeks. But we have a a manumission document, which is basically the Freedom Papers, um, for a slave owned by Francis Scott Key. Um, and Francis Scott Key, you may know, was a member of the bar in Adams County. Uh, he he was a, an attorney from uh, neighboring Frederick County, Maryland. Joined the bar here in Adams County in the early 1800s before he became really famous. Um, and then in 1831, of course, after he's, he's quite famous, uh, he's living in Washington, D.C. Um, and at that time, you know, he, he wanted to, to travel to a, a courthouse in a supposed free state, although there was still slavery in Adams County 
at the time, but Pennsylvania was not having, you know, there were, there were no new slaves um, at that point. There was a gradual abolition taking place. Anyway, Francis Scott Key in 1831 came here and uh, filed these documents at our courthouse, uh, setting free um, the slave named Clem Johnson. Um, and I believe we know Clem ended up returning with Key to continue to work for the Key family. But um, this freedom paper was executed here at our courthouse in 1831, and we have the original a manumission document that's signed by Francis Scott Key. So I think that's probably the rarest and most special cool. document to me. Um, what do you think, Tim? What's your... Well, I'd say that, you know, the near and dear to me is the plat of Gettysburg for the lottery uh, that dates from um, 1785. So uh, we actually have this uh, document that lays out the lots, the original 210 town lots in Gettysburg to scale, and it has the name inside the lot of the person who won that lot in a lottery that was held to decide who would have the option to buy uh, each of the lots in the town when it was laid out by James Geddes. So it's an actual document from 1785, and it's just really cool. It has the names of the early streets on it and stuff, and there's some things on it that we just wouldn't know if we didn't have that. Although some of the information from it's published in the 1886 history. And then maybe, um, uh, you know, for me, being uh, a Battle of Gettysburg uh, person or aficionado, you know, the sign that hung in the square of Gettysburg with the <laughs> bullet holes in it, uh, that, to me, is really, really priceless. Right, right. And then I might have to say um, the surgeon's kit. I mean, we have a surgeon's kit uh, that was used by Thomas Means. Um, uh, I believe he's with the 11, Anderson's Brigade. Yeah, 11th Georgia, I believe. Um, Georgia. And it was used at the John Edward Plank Farm. And the, the saw, it, you know, was left here. And it was eventually obtained by uh, J.W.C. O'Neill, and his relatives donated it to the Adams County Historical Society. And, you know, just to pick up that saw and to know that that was used to amputate leg, arms and legs of Confederate soldiers after the battle at this farm, I, you know, I don't know what you could say that would be more you know, valuable to a Civil War story and something like that. Right, right. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I think, uh, you know, we obviously we have over a million items in the collection and we're still finding incredible items. I like telling the story about a few years ago, I was going through a box and found an original program from the Gettysburg Address. Um, and, uh, you know, so there are things like that that we continue yeah. to discover. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we're very excited about yeah. our future as an organization to make sure all these items have a proper home. Um, you may not know, but now our, our current facility is not ideal, and we're working very hard on plans that we'll be announcing uh, next month uh, about our, our new facility. Um, so there'll be more on that on December 16th. Uh, but thank you all so much for joining us tonight um, with... Uh, um, with uh, for this program, and I uh, just before you go, I hope you'll consider the link to uh, the Adams County Community Foundation giving spree. I posted it at the top of the video here, um, and it's also in the comment section. Uh, if you're able to help and support us, we receive matching funds. That's only good through midnight tonight. So I hope you'll take a, a few minutes and make a small donation, whatever you can do. Um, it helps us so much, and it's going to help us really uh, cross the finish line here before we make our big announcement um, next month. But uh, it was a pleasure being with you again tonight. We're going to be doing this every Thursday for the rest of the year, uh, into next year. Uh, so I hope uh, you're, you're enjoying these programs, and uh, we're really so uh, thankful to have such wonderful support and um, following on Facebook. Uh, we're now the number one followed historical society in, in Pennsylvania on Facebook, which I think is, <laughs> is, uh, is, is good and a testament to all the wonderful people that are out there who really care about what we're doing here. So I uh, hope everybody has a good night and you're safe and, and healthy, and uh, we will be back with you next Thursday. Um, thanks again, everybody.